Lisa the Painful is a pretty okay game that I talk about on very rare occasions. I don't really care about the game that much, but I cared about it enough to give it its own full video last year, and I thought it was a nice little ribbon on the gift box. Pretty much everything said there was the rest of the things I could say about the game. Ignoring Joyful for a very good reason. If you haven't seen that video yet, I recommend you do, especially if you have no idea what in God's name Elisa is. Now, what I didn't expect was for that video to blow up as much as it did. I talk about some popular and not so popular games, but boy, the most random stuff is just a hit with the mainstream YouTube crowd for no reason, huh? And just when I ran out of things to say and I could finally relax and talk about stuff I haven't talked about a billion times, June hit us with a bombshell. <laughs> Dinkling had been making vague tweets potentially hinting towards something Lisa related. Eventually, we got confirmation that something new was coming. Was it a sequel? Some other side story? Perhaps it even involved Tom Forknight? Well, in early June, we finally got our answer. Lisa Definitive Edition. Holy crap, after all these years, I finally got some new material to work with. And just as I thought I was done, too! With the assistance of the new publisher Serenity Forge, this would not only serve as an updated re-release, but also double as a console port for every modern platform. And it promised updated graphics, new events, cutscenes, and content, and an assist- in assist mode. Needless to say, I was excited that one of the three good video games in this world got some new life breathed into it. So yeah, if you weren't sick of me talking about Lisa yet, then now you will be! I'm typically not the type of person to make these short form review videos talking about minor things and whatnot. I really like to go in depth with what I'm talking about and find stuff with a lot more meat to it if you catch my drift. Does he know? But you know, it's Lisa related, and I kinda have an obligation to talk about it. And while I'm at it, I finally have an opportunity to replay and discuss Lisa the Joyful, which I would have done earlier earlier had that other video not underperform. No harm in doing something shorter, I suppose. I mean, it's just an enhanced re-release. There's no way the new content added is that major. I can't imagine there being any additions that are integral to the story and prove to be points of contention in the fanbase that shake the game's complete plot to its very core or anything. Why would this update ever include anything aside from a few small changes in quality of life improvements, much less things that could become controversial talking points that will haunt the community until the last of it rots away at the rest of this planet during the end of the universe as we know it? I'm sorry, what was I talking about again? First things first, let's discuss pricing. I haven't even booted up the freaking game yet and we already have a problem. Elisa was originally $10 on Steam, while Lisa the Joyful was $5. These were totally fair price points, especially in Joyful's case considering that it was about half as long, had far less replay value, and was overall a far worse game. Aww. But ever since Definitive Edition launched, the price for both games has doubled. For those of you who can't do basic math, Painful is now $20, while Joyful has gone up to 10. Let me clarify, if these games launched at these prices, I wouldn't really be upset. Painful is worth $20 for sure, even if you only do one playthrough of it. And if you're someone like me who's played it five times now, then you're absolutely getting your money's worth. Meanwhile, 10 for Joyful is really pushing it because it's it's bad, dude. It's not good. This game isn't good. Look, we can argue all day about the monetary value of these games, and while I do think there's an argument to be made about these games being worth more than their previous price points, Dingling decided years ago that these original prices was what they were worth. So by doubling the admission fee for both, that kind of implies that they've doubled in value. Which, while I don't want to get too ahead of myself, the new content and changes don't really warrant the price increase in my opinion. Thankfully, if you already purchased the games beforehand, the definitive editions are free updates, and on top of that, you'll still have the option to play the older versions of the games when booting. Alright, so what has changed to make this game worth 18 billion? First things first, this is no longer an RPG Maker game. That's right, Lisa now runs off of Unity, which I didn't realize at first, but whenever you start seeing some of the newer graphics and stuff, it becomes a lot more noticeable. The sprites are cleaned up for higher resolutions and now come with a border that covers up the unused space on the screen and changes depending on your current location in the game. It's the same thing Undertale and Omori did with their console ports, you should be used to it by now. It's commonplace at this point, but if you don't like the borders, then there's an option to turn them off. These changes to presentation also apply to battle. Battle backgrounds are animated now, which look great, and I think enhance the tense atmosphere of the mutant fights. The pacing of battles has also been changed to be a little bit quicker. Normally, I'd be in favor of making fights in an RPG go by faster, but the execution here is very sloppy. The enemy's turn plays out at a breakneck pace, and whenever there's more than one of them on screen, it can become difficult 
to figure out what even happened because of how little time you get to read attack descriptions. And I don't really get why this change was necessary considering that Lisa was already a very well paced game both during and outside of combat. Also for some reason, damage over time from status effects such as poison or fire isn't visible anymore and I really don't get why this is the case. All this change does is make it unclear to the player how effective these status effects are or if they're even working at all. It's wild that updating the game to a more versatile software somehow ended up making the battle presentation far more disorganized. There is some quality of life stuff added though. In battle, status effects and their modifiers are now shown, which is a very welcome addition. While I had a vague idea as to what all of the status effects did, it's nice to finally have some clarification for all of them. But the best addition by far is so minor, yet I could never live without it. There's now a hotkey for getting on and off the bike, and I know it took them 9 years to add this, but trust me, it was well worth the effort. However, there are other minor changes that I really don't like. A lot of the old stock RPG Maker sound effects got replaced with new original ones, and I get wanting to use original sound effects, but the old ones were just so heavily associated with Lisa to me that I can't really jive with the new ones. <laughs> Speaking of sound changes, let's talk about the giraffe in the room. About the time I reached the end of Area 1, I came to a horrible realization. New publisher, new console ports. Hey wait, this game might be under some strict surveillance now. Uh, what if they get rid of a certain song that uses a certain sound clip from a certain other copyrighted material? No, they would never do that. Do you really think someone would change the most iconic, most legendary, most hilarious song in the entire game? What, are they stupid? Well, off to kill myself. They changed to work harder. The original version of Work Harder sampled a grunt sound effect from Shinmu 2. <laughs> it's random, it's absurd, and that's what makes it so damn funny. However, if someone from Sega found out about a sound effect from one of their games being used without their permission, they might have grounds to sue Dingling over it. Maybe. I always figured this was okay because it fell under fair use, and considering that Sega is no stranger to sampling sound clips for their own music and that this game has been out for almost a decade now and hasn't gone through any legal trouble, I honestly doubt that the song needed to be changed. But Serenity Forge probably saw this as a big no-no and they farted everywhere and had it swapped out with this new, far worse version. My issue with it isn't even that it's a new sound, it's that the sound itself doesn't have the same oomph that the original one did. It sounds like someone trying to recreate work hard but it's 2 a.m. and their mom might get mad if they make too much noise. New to the game is an assist mode. Elisa bros, it's just over! Early on in the game, Terry now offers Brad his Terroids, which is admittedly pretty funny. They're a new key item, which once you use them, lower the game's difficulty to the new painless mode, reducing enemy stats to make the game easier. Once you take them, this option can't be reversed. Not that you should take them anyway. Now before any of you call me a tryhard elitist who hates casual gamers, first off, yeah, you're right, casual gamers who play on easy mode should be burned at the stake! And second off, I think an assist mode like this kinda hurts some of the appeal of Lisa. This is a game where shit can hit the fan at any moment. Your party members' lives are always on the line, you can lose items and stats depending on your choices, and taking that tension away by making every encounter far easier kinda goes against the tone the game tries to set. Besides, I've always thought that starting from Area 2 onward, the game gets far easier since your options really open up at that point and you can gain access to much much stronger party members that can help you cheese most encounters. And if you still find the game difficult, even with all those overpowered options at your disposal, you can still use Joy if you're really desperate. In fact, I always saw using Joy as an easy mode, except at least in this case you're making fights easy by using a limited resource, even if said limited resource isn't that limited. In painless mode, however, that same resource management isn't required. It's funny that Joyful had a whole joke dedicated to making fun of easy modes in games, and not only is that joke so still there, but now it has the very thing that was being made fun of. If you haven't played Lisa before, I recommend for your first playthrough that you play on normal and preferably without using Joy as the whole game is balanced without Joy being necessary. Do yourself a favor and don't use Painless Mode, unless if your name is Mai and Dad. I think a better inclusion was the Tutorial Handbook. This is a new item that's off the beaten path, but still very easy to find. It gives you more details on various battle mechanics and strategies. I personally think it's better to figure these things 
things out as you go along and teach yourself about how to pull through fights in the most efficient way possible. I mean, it's almost like there's a reason why this wasn't originally in the game. Uh, but I think an encyclopedia about the game's mechanics is a far better way of lowering the bar of entry for new players than outright making the game easier. With all this talk of difficulty and mechanics, let's talk about some of the new V-balancing. Yeah, at least it got freaking patch notes. Interesting enough though, most of these are nerfs. I've said this numerous times before, but while Lisa advertises itself as a rock-hard game for people with four testicles like myself, it falls victim to cheese. Party members like Birdie and Fly completely break the game while not requiring that much effort to obtain. Brody's oil spit turns battles into firefights like we're in California or something, and Fly's vomit abilities take an already broken strategy, that being status stacking, and wrapping it up into one move like a dangerous burrito. <laughs> Paco Bell. When making the transition to Definitive Edition, Birdie's Oil Spit now costs more TP, Vomit seems less effective, I didn't notice it adding as many status effects as it used to, and now both of these characters, among others, have become druggies. Now, Joy Withdrawal doesn't really hurt Birdie that much since he's mostly a support-oriented character anyway, but that's a pretty big blow to fly. I think this is a good change, however, as it now encourages you to be more experimental with party members and makes other strategies far more viable. With that said, however, this this came as a surprise to me, but Birdie and Fly were always intended to have Joy Withdrawal, but due to a programming bug in the original release, they didn't. This bug applied to a couple other characters and has been fixed now, the others including... I want to be honest, I'm kind of glad it was bugged, because characters like Rage and Garth really don't deserve it. Rage is a slow burn character who costs a lot to recruit early on, and giving him a joy addiction just makes him all the more unappealing. Worst of all though, is that outside of fixing moves that outright didn't work in the original game, none of the bad party members got buffed at all. Characters like Clint or Queen didn't deserve joy addictions to begin with, yet they're still stuck with them. Making the good characters a little worse doesn't necessarily help to make the bad ones more useful. The only buff I can think of off the top of my head is that supposedly Crisp's wet cutter attack now oils up enemies, making him the second party member after Birdie that can inflict this status effect. Now, does this make him any better? No. He still SUCKS! While I'm at it, I should also mention that there's now a hidden EXP share. I don't know, for the main game at least, this wasn't necessary, and the game really isn't balanced with this in mind. There's also no mention of it anywhere in the game, I just noticed that some party members I wasn't using were getting new attacks even though they had never been in my party. And there's no option to turn it off. On one hand, this takes away some of the weight of losing a party member because you can just go to your backlog of a billion other characters and they're ready to go without any training required. But on the other hand, this does not encourage more experimentation, and after seeing the one piece of substantial new content Definitive Edition has to offer, I kinda changed my tune on this inclusion. You'll see why when we get there. There is also a really, really stupid combat change made, that being that TP characters no longer get TP when they get hit. Perhaps this was added to nerf Birdie even more because they just developed a random raging hate boner for him all of a sudden, but all it really did was slow down the pace of battle since TP guys are typically really good damage dealers. When you make even the most minor combat change to a game that wasn't designed with it in mind, you really need to go back and alter everything to accommodate for it, and it's clear that the team didn't bother doing this at all. It's at its worst when playing Joyful, since Buddy is a TP character in most of the games she's going solo, getting TP is borderline impossible and makes the game even more of a chore than it already was. Buddy was meant to take a lot of hits and then turn around and unload on everyone, but now she can't do that. You cannot convince me that somebody tested this and thought it was okay or even remotely fun. Against God's will, they somehow made the gameplay of Lisa the Joyful even worse. Thankfully, halfway through my Joyful playthrough, an update was released reverting the TP back to how it used to work with adjusted values. And what do you know, making the mechanics work the way they were originally intended to makes the game less bad. What? Really? Speaking of oversights, there's a plethora of bugs that simply didn't exist before. Throughout my playthrough, the game crashed on me five times, and on one occasion the menu disappeared mid-battle, softlocking me and forcing me to reload my last save. Also, this random glitch where the fast travel menu pops up again is still here. I never ran 
into it until I was getting footage for my first video on this game back in November, and it's weird to see it again. It's like it was meant to be or something. Old bugs haven't been fixed, and several new ones have been introduced. The worst part is that I can't play pain mode now. I'm too hesitant to touch it again due to the possibility of the game crashing. I could lose tons of progress, and the only poor decision that resulted in that outcome was me playing Definitive Edition. I know I'm not the only one suffering from crashes thanks to Steam message boards, so that just begs the question, how did such a common issue make it past quality assurance? I'm working on it! I'm aware that patches are being released to address the crashing, but these should have never been here to begin with, especially considering the not definitive version has never crashed on me before. I know I've been pretty harsh on this re-release, but when your update has crashes and bugs that didn't used to be there, reworked mechanics that don't work, and countless unnecessary changes to battle presentation, all while being referred to as the definitive edition, it kinda opens it up to a lot of scrutiny. The last possible saving grace for this game has to be the new content that was heavily advertised, which was the thing I was looking forward to the most. So, let's take a look and see if that's enough to make this version superior. It's not. But first, I didn't know where else to fit this into the video, but real quick, I want to talk about some altered content. Or, well, a much more bad-sounding word would have to be censorship. Yeah, we can't release anything that was even remotely edgy into the modern age without said edge having to be sanded off. It happened with Sam and Max, and it's happening with Lisa now. Though, in this game's case, it's not really a big deal. Junior Sprite got altered to make him look less stereotypical, and Salvation Black's sound effect got changed. <laughs> I can't possibly fathom why they changed that. Well, I thought it sounded fine! Some people have been freaking out over these changes and like... I really... I really don't care. I didn't really mind whether or not these got altered, but I understand why they did change them, and they're so minor that they don't really detract from the game's tone. Seriously, if you're going to write a negative review of this game because it's now LISA THE WOKE FOR- and I'm sorry, but that kind of speaks volumes about you as a person. This isn't the same case as outright removing dialogue in a comedic game and then the devs mocking people for feeling like they were lied to by being led to believe that none of the dialogue would get cut. However, then there's Sony's censorship. If you're playing this game on PlayStation, then items such as cigarettes and alcohol will be replaced by candy and non-alcoholic beverages to comply with Sony's regulations. Dude? We now have the 4Kids version of Lisa. I find it hilarious that a minor drinking beer and smoking is crossing the line, but... Getting raped isn't. Sony really has their priorities straight, huh? Okay, sorry about that. Now for the actual new content. Who's gonna tell him? Well, uh, there's the new side area where you find Terry's tutorial handbook. That's pretty neat. There's also a new mutant, but the way to access him is so specific that I question why he was even added. So, okay, there's these guys in area two, right? If you give them TNT, then they'll blow up the karate village and everyone there. So not only are you giving up precious TNT for no reason since you can ignore them by going around them using this cliff, but also it kills everyone in the area, locking you out of some side quests. If you do, for whatever reason, give them the TNT though, you can go back Back to the village and now you can fight the new mutant Morty. Ooh, just one letter off from being cool. Thinking about it, this probably just exists so you can still get the island map even if you choose to bomb the place, but yeah, I'm not surprised I missed this. Just don't get these guys your TNT. It's never worth it. There are also campfire scenes that serve as party chats, and you know, I can actually get down with these. A friend of mine who played this game a few years ago once mentioned that he wished that there was more dialogue with the other party members, even if they were optional, and I totally get where he's coming from, and I'm glad to see that realized. There are a lot of conversations to find some involve multiple party members at once, and those are really fun. But my favorite has to be Olan's, though I never saw it myself since to get it you have to use Joy, but it does something really cool with one of my favorite party members while also using previously unused content in a unique way. I won't spoil it, even though anyone who's played the game but hasn't seen the cutscene can probably infer what happens. Alrighty then, what's next? NOTHING! ABSOLUTELY NOTHING! What? What do you mean that's it? I've spent god knows how much time putting this stupid video together just to talk about bad changes to one of my favorite games, and that's all the new content there is to offer? This is an outrage. Surely there's something of actual substance here, right? Well, what if I told you there is more? Originally, I didn't even think I was going to make this video. I don't typically do simplistic short reviews like this, and seeing as there wasn't anything major to be found initially, I figured I just wouldn't bother. But then... I did find something, and if you haven't finished Definitive Edition yet, then 
I'll tell you how to find this new secret, but after that point, I suggest you leave. Alright, so I got this information from my pet goldfish who works at Nintendo, and we all know that he's a reliable source. So after you've gathered up all of the materials to make the boat to head off to the main game's finale, what I suggest you do instead is say, Screw that! Let's go all the way back to the very first campfire in the game and have a nap! <laughs> Aw, oh, fuck. You see, this is why I never eat Burger King before bed. So, now you get this weird nightmare sequence that, I'm gonna be real, while it's so cool visually, at the same time, this whole thing feels kind of out of place. There's a lot of weird navigation, and especially when it comes to the battles here, they make me think of, like, literally any other dark RPG maker game, and at the same time, they don't really mean anything. And the visuals that do mean something don't really tell you anything that you can't already learn from the main story. I gotta admit though, this scared the shit out of me. That sprite will haunt me for as long as I live, and it was only on screen for like three seconds. The battles come off as pretty tryhardish, like a bro thinks he's Omori, they just feel really pretentious. After that, we eventually end up in front of Brad's house and we come face to face with Marty again. Marty Armstrong. I don't really think about him much. Brad's abusive father that shows up at the start of the game and the end and then never again. Yeah, he's such an important character despite the lack of screen time, even without seeing him for most of the series, I think we can all agree he's the worst person in the games and the cause of almost every problem that would occur throughout the series. After a long and very drawn out conversation with the old man who's now blue dobby dee dobby die, we reach a blood red sea before coming face to face with him once more. He talks down to his son like he always does before... Oh my gosh, that's that's a reused sprite. But but seriously, what is going on? This is the manifestation of Marty, the cultivation of Brad's traumatic memories with his father and Lisa the Painful's new super boss. And let me tell you, tough fight doesn't even begin to describe this literal nightmare. At the start of the fight, you get to change out your party members and their equipment. Once you're ready, you move on to phase one. During this phase, you'll fight shadows of your current party. Not much to say here. Once you're done, you actually get to Mount Marty, and that's unfortunately a command and not a racetrack. This phase has you fighting Marty spiders that, while numerous, aren't really that threatening to the party in their current state. Afterwards, you finally get to fight the big man himself. Marty is surrounded by egg sacs that don't do anything except calcify, making them immune to all damage. Should you destroy them, you get one as an item that we'll get to use later. In the meantime, you need to focus on whittling down Marty's 100,000 health. Again, not too terribly threatening so long as you keep up with healing, however, raw damage is not where the danger of this fight truly lies. After several turns of being up there, Marty will grab one of your party members and consume them, permanently killing them. He'll continue doing this until you're out of party members or you retreat. Retreating takes you back to the party menu where you can swap out any missing party members for new ones and heal up. While you're down here, you can use any egg sacs you obtained, which will fully heal a party member as well as give them a massive EXP boost to help them level up. From there, you have to go through the first two phases again before you get another shot at Marty, who retains his HP from the previous cycle. However, as the fight proceeds onward, the phases get tougher and tougher. The shadows will start locking party members down and preventing their turn. They'll set up devastating counters, and whenever Marty gets really low on health, when they die, they'll KO the party member they're a shadow of, which can leave you open on phase two. Phase two will now include any party member you lost on phase three as a giant, giant enemy, enemy spider. spider, and after a while, special Special guest Tricky Rick from Lisa the First makes an appearance and he's a dick, both figuratively and literally. He causes random status effects on everyone every turn and can disrupt you if left unchecked, not to mention he can revive himself if given enough turns to do so. It's also worth mentioning that whenever you beat the first two phases, you'll get EXP and a good chunk of items to help you keep going. But that's essentially how the fight goes. Reach the top, do as much damage to Marty as you can, and escape before he grabs someone important, use any egg sacs you got, rinse and repeat. Conceptually, I like this fight because of how grand it is. Visually, it's unlike anything the series has seen before, Kind of a dead giveaway that this isn't an RPG Maker game anymore. The music is intense and the visuals are spectacular, and it gives you a great opportunity to utilize every party member, but at the same time, 
I think the execution is beyond overkill. 100,000 health is only 20,000 more than Mike, the previous super boss, but this fight still manages to take much, much, much longer due to Marty having more bulk, and how every time you want to fight him, you have to go through those first two phases again, and they just get longer on every subsequent attempt. It's not even like you have that much time to damage Marty, because I find that if you stay up there for any longer than four or five turns, you're putting yourself at major risk of losing a party member, which you're going to need as many of them as you can get your hands on. Marty is immune to most status effects, but he's still vulnerable to oiled up and pissed off. Oiled up can greatly increase your damage output, while making him pissed makes him hit much harder, but also prevents him from consuming party members, which lets you stay on phase three for longer. I feel so mixed on this whole fight. On my first attempt, I was nowhere near prepared for it, mentally speaking at least. I got him down to 70,000 health before realizing that I simply didn't have the patience for it and I needed to prepare more. However, I want you to think about this. What's the best way to prepare for this fight? Well, that would be by gathering every party member you can and grinding. However, during this playthrough, I already had several party members die through Russian Roulette or because of Joy Mutants, but I just wrote them off because I don't like to save scum in this game. I find Lisa so easy now that I'm willing to casually lose party members to throw me off my game. But if you play that way and let a lot of party members get killed, then you could potentially throw your chances of winning this fight and be forced to start a new playthrough so that you could have a fighting chance. So, I went back, I grinded a couple levels, I got every party member that I didn't think I was going to need previously, including Buckets. I had to save scum the Russian Roulette minigame because I need Buckets, he's a great damage dealer, but I can't possibly risk losing even one party member because that could screw me out of winning this fight that I want so desperately to win. Dog, I'm stubborn. I've dealt with enough hairy fat guys in my life and I wasn't going to let this one beat me. However, save scumming and not accepting loss because of your decisions kind of goes against one of the selling points of Lisa, but if I didn't do that, then would I be able to win this fight? In reality, I only lost a couple and several of them went unused, but how was I supposed to know that that was going to be the outcome? The saying, better safe than sorry, has never been more relevant. And like I said, this is long. Probably the longest fight I've ever been through in any video game I've ever played. My recording for my successful attempt at this fight took two and a half hours. And as if this boss wasn't stressful enough, I was also worrying about the game crashing since it loved to do that, or my recording software bugging out. Once you get Marty down to half health, he starts permanently reducing your stats at the end of every turn, and at that point, I swear, I could have just started crying because of how pressured I felt. I really don't know if I love or hate the length of this fight, because on one hand, it's terrifying, it's intense, it's stressful. But if you can't handle two and a half hours of this, imagine suffering well over a decade of this man's abuse and insults without any power to stop him. I feel like Lisa already did a fine enough job at painting Marty as the horrible person he is, but this battle unveils the true extent of how depraved he truly was. I wish this fight was toned down a little bit or made a little less tedious, because preparing for it really does undermine the way the game is intended to be played, but I do respect the attempt and what it was trying to convey, and I'll sure as hell never forget it. Your reward for completing the fight is getting to see just a little bit more of Lisa and her last interaction with Brad. It's a touching cutscene, and I think it does a good job at humanizing a character that otherwise never really had much character. Uh, too bad I couldn't fully appreciate it because I was too busy being terrified at the thought of the game crashing. But a uh, funny thing, when you wake up, all of your party members who died mid-battle stay dead even though the manifestation of Marty wasn't real, and also you get 99 joys so you can go to town on the finale without a care in the world. Wow, they really crammed the two hours of new content into one boss fight. This took me a fourth of the playthrough to do. I don't dislike it, but I definitely feel like it could have been paced better while still conveying the same message. Anyway, from one fun thing to another, let's talk about Joyful now. Yippee! I don't know if you could tell or not, but I don't particularly care for Lisa the Joyful. I just like Buddy as a character, she's insufferable and takes her actually justified anger out on people like Rando who don't deserve it. The combat is worse since it requires less strategy and hinges on timing this finicky action command thing like Bro thinks he's Mario and Luigi. And once you realize there's no punishment for using Joy, you can just be a brain dead drug addict and spam it for any encounter that could potentially be challenging. I was pretty optimistic about Definitive Edition though, because it gave this flawed game a chance to shine. Serenity 4 
George saw this optimism and thought it would be very happy dog.png to make the game worse. Yeah, the TP change made this playthrough even worse for the first half of it, but like I said, I did get to play the rest of the game post-patch. First major new addition is Buddy has new moves at her disposal. When you defeat one of the Warlords, Buddy gets an ability corresponding to them like Bro thinks she's Mega Man. Now, whenever games get re-releases and have new offensive options available, it comes with the risk of the old unchanged content not being balanced with your new arsenal of abilities in mind and therefore making the game easier than it originally was. But the thing is, is that this is Lisa the Joyful. It wasn't a well-balanced game to begin with. Look at this dude. I'm grinding three items off of him and he refuses to attack me. What a well-thought-out ability. I actually like most of the Warlord abilities, though. They help Buddy be self-sufficient, which was something she previously was not very good at doing. The second wind, Gallows' ability sets her up with a free revival upon death, and provided you have the TP for it, you can do this as many times as you want throughout a battle. Don't know if I'd consider it busted, but considering how tedious some of these fights can get, anything that keeps me from dying and having to redo them is a plus in my book. Fun fact, this isn't the first time Buddy has gotten a skill list update. Apparently in the first version of Joyful, her abilities were limited mostly to the time slashing attacks, and that's it. I first played this game in 2018 after she got some status moves added to her skills, and now that we have even more attacks to work with, I can confidently say that she has an actually robust moveset now. Like I stated multiple times, this game can be a, a real pain in the ass, so during my first playthrough, I gave up on going joyless and started popping a joy during every major fight so that the game would be somewhat tolerable. But unlike painful, there isn't any punishment for using joy, so unless if you somehow run out, there's nothing discouraging you from spamming joy to breeze through the game. It's not fun for every fight to take 10 years and have the outcome rely on you timing a button press correctly over constructing a genuine strategy, and same goes for using an item that's in generous supply to sweep everything in the game. However, now we have better means of beating the game joyless, and now there's a reason to, as that's how you access the new content. The writing on the wall telling you to use joy is still present though, so uh, that's a bit of a conflicting message. But that won't stop me because I can't read! Alright, so if you get through the game joyless and defeat all of the warlords, you can now participate in a little treasure hunt. And it's pretty dumb. So because secrets and video games now have to be cryptically hidden through ARG bullshit, most of this game's new content just involves you hunting for items randomly placed in the world that are really damn hard to find. Finding some of these involves jumping across cliffs that look like dead ends, revisiting old areas and interacting with inconspicuous objects, and standing in place for several minutes so a rat throws you a fish. What am I, a homeless man? No, I'm worse than that. I'm Buddy Armstrong. Anyway, after doing dumb stuff so that I can do the thing I actually wanted to do, you need to get to this tucked away area near the list, press the pause button on this flower, and now you're in this room with a bunch of statues. Still following? No. Okay, glad that we're all on the same page. So now you need to interact with and break these statues in a specific order. During the obnoxiously long Twizzler climb after the Marty boss and Painful, you may remember no friends, no brothers, no fathers, no mothers, just me. There's your hint. Put the items you've collected in this order. And now a door will appear at the list, leading you to the new super boss of Lisa the Joyful. Now this fight is long too, but nowhere near to the extent of Painfuls. This time, you find yourself fighting all of the warlords on the list at the same time. It may seem overwhelming, but I actually like this new fight a lot because of how well designed it is around Buddy's new abilities. Pacify and Wolf Stance get a lot of strategic use here, which is much appreciated in a game that otherwise doesn't have much strategy to it. Some of the warlords are far more threatening than others, so I recommend you focus them down first. This fight is more more than manageable if you know what you're doing. My only issue with it is that, again, it's pretty long. It took me about an hour because some of the warlords have healing abilities, which prolongs the battle for way longer than they need to. Not only that, but if Buddy gets silenced at any point, she's a sitting duck for several turns since she can't use any damage dealing moves while silenced. Sometimes she would stay that way for upwards of five turns, which is ridiculous considering that there's nothing I can do about it aside from waiting out the timer so that I can actually play the game again. Anyway, after you win that grueling fight, you're reward is a nipple. Yippee! So when you get the nipple, go to the joy lab from the base game and keep going past the coffin to this new secret room. This takes you to an area resembling Brad's neighborhood from whenever he was a kid. Here you can see characters like Buzzo and Rick, Sticky and Cheeks, talking about Brad. The dialogue gives you more insight into their thought processes during the events of Painful, and it's kind of odd to see all these years later, but I don't really mind the addition, and I don't think it takes away from the story. So once you're done out here, go inside Brad's house, go upstairs to this bedroom, and you'll find... A skull under the bed. And apparently this is Buddy's skull. 
Okay. Then you find this room with a mound of flesh, put the sacred nipple on the flesh, and walk behind it. Oh my god. After enough walking around in white space, you'll stumble across this oddly colored flower that you can put into Buddy's skull. After you've done that, you've now unlocked the brand new true ending. The true ending plays out the same way as the normal ending does for the most part. You fight Sweetheart, you meet Yato, and cut down his doughy seat. And at this point, I was wondering, when are we going to get to the new stuff? I had sat through the ending two other times earlier, getting the other endings for achievements, and not to mention the game decided to crash one last time during the Yato fight, forcing me to go back and grab the skull again. So at this point, I was done, and I just wanted to see, what could this true ending possibly add? Okay, so now, Buddy goes off on Buzzo. She talks about how she viewed Buzzo as a strong, terrifying person with action behind his words, but eventually realized who he really was. A pathetic loser who blames everyone else for his problems rather than himself. A coward who never cared about Lisa, and a horrible person who pinned her death on a man who couldn't possibly have had any control over their situation. She now realizes Brad never deserved that torment. He never deserved any of the pain he went through in his life, even though several hours prior she called him a worse father than the man who was actually responsible for Lisa's abuse. And and then she caps this off with, Maybe Lisa would still be alive if she never met you. And you know, Dangling thought that line was hard. You should kill yourself now! Out of everything added to Definitive Edition, this is no doubt the most contentious edition, and it's not hard to see why. Buddy is preaching about this girl who was dead long before she was even born, and now she's acting like she knows her better than someone who actually spoke with her. It's implied that Buddy somehow gained some knowledge of Lisa or her memories when she obtains the flower and puts it in her skull, which, if that is the case, then it's dumb. Lisa has always had some unrealistic elements to it, but it's never gone outright supernatural. Anything of that sort could always be written off as a hallucination, something that didn't actually happen, but the fact that Buddy now knows who Lisa is and knows a lot about her apparently implies that this hallucination, or whatever it is, granted her that knowledge. Which is totally out of left field for the series considering no other scene like this has ever given a character knowledge about something they shouldn't know about. But even then, Buddy has no business business going off on Buzzo like this. Don't get me wrong, there's truth behind some of her words. Buzzo was by no means a good person. Far from it, actually. He helped a man cause the apocalypse and tortured and blamed Brad for the death of his sister when he could have never helped her if he tried. He's a petty, terrible human being, but there's a reason why he is the way he is. Lisa was not a bad person, and she never deserved her abuse. Nobody deserves that kind of torment. However, the way she treated Buzzo was wrong. Making him cut a cat's paw with a saw and then forcing him to cut her is a terrible thing that's never justified no matter how many horrible things you've been through. There are people out there who have had to suffer through a lot of pain, but those same people can still hurt and do bad things to others. This doesn't make Lisa a bad person by any means. However, you can't say that she never did anything wrong, because that simply isn't true. And the whole, maybe Lisa would still be alive if she never met you line is probably the worst piece of dialogue in the whole series. How does Buddy supposedly know so much about Lisa all of a sudden, but doesn't know anything about her actual abuser that drove her to commit suicide? Why, of all people, does she blame it on Buzzo, who, up until Lisa's death, had never done anything wrong as far as we're aware? Buzzo wasn't a saint, far from it, but saying that he was responsible for Lisa's death is beyond moronic, and the worst part is that this is played completely straight as if what Buddy is saying is the correct conclusion to come to. There's a weird subset of the community that acts as if Buzzo never did anything wrong when no, he did. He, he did He did a lot of things wrong. And you can argue that he never got the punishment that he deserved for his wrongdoings, but people will have bad opinions. It happens all the time in fan bases like this. And the last thing you should do in a case like this is hit the player over the head with how they're supposed to feel. One of my favorite things about the story of Lisa is how most of it is morally gray. Brad is a man who's been through so much pain and suffering throughout his life, and he thinks he's doing the right thing by keeping Buddy captive from the rest 
the world. But as you continue playing, you realize Brad does bad things too, and what he's doing is pretty harmful to the rest of Olaf, even if his intentions are good. Buzzo should have never had to watch a friend be tormented by abuse, but the way he responded to the situation was wrong, and he doesn't realize his wrongdoings and try to correct them until it's too late. You can say the original ending didn't punish him enough, but tough shit that happens in real life. Sometimes bad people don't get called out for it or punished accordingly. Nevertheless, he still dies trying to redeem himself when he lost that chance a long time ago, and it's up for the player to realize Oh wait, you're still a pretty bad person though. Same with how Buddy treats Brad during this new ending. Throughout both painful and joyful, Buddy treats Brad worse than literally any other person. But by the end of Joyful, after the Brad hallucination, you can kind of infer that maybe Buddy doesn't feel as distasteful towards him anymore. Maybe she realizes that he really did love her and that maybe he was just a misguided, broken man. Buddy hasn't completely forgiven him yet, but in time she'll eventually understand understand how he truly fell. In the new ending, no, lol, I'm just gonna have a complete 180 on this guy was shit-talking a few hours ago. I think the purpose of this new content was dingling atoning for a bad comment he made one time, where for some reason he said out of every character in the series, he thought Lisa was the worst person. The tweet is long gone now, so I don't know the full context behind it, but it was probably just a really bad take. Everybody is in the wrong headspace once in a while and will say something stupid. We've all been there. However, specifically with this new ending, it feels like dingling didn't just take back that statement, he backpedaled so hard that he needed to include more content surrounding the character herself as some sort of apology. Oh please guys, please forgive me for having a stupid take several years ago that I don't agree with anymore, please! Bro, chill. I appreciate getting to see more of the character, but you didn't have to go this far to apologize to the point where you're mutilating the plot and outright ignoring details that paint the character as anything other than completely spotless. You didn't have to be so blunt with how you wanted people to interpret the story. I swear, this is yick levels of bad. And I remember comparing these two games in Lisa's favor, and now it's doing the very same thing I hated about that game's character writing. How dare I come to my own conclusions about the story of a video game and how it's supposed to be interpreted. It's almost like that's what I enjoy about video game stories to begin with. I love stories that make me want to think about them, stories that don't tell me how to feel, stories that show me something interesting and ask me how I feel about what I just saw. I'm sorry, this ending is bad, and say what you will about Joyful, but the original ending did its job fine enough, and including a new one because of idiots on the internet who have bad opinions was a terrible idea. Why is it so hard to make a good re-release? Time and time again, a game will get a definitive edition or an updated port and something will be lost during the transition, or the new content will clash with the old and go against the original vision. I'm disappointed to say that Lisa Definitive Edition is another case of this. This isn't a terrible way of playing the game, and if you've never played the game before, then after you get some more patches, this should probably be your go-to for the upgrades that are there. But when you mess up the battle presentation, mess with mechanics, mechanics that didn't need to change, introduce countless bugs and glitches that didn't used to be there, double the price and add in new story elements that conflict with the sound plot, all while labeling this new version as the definitive edition, of course I'm going to criticize it. Like I said, this isn't a bad way to play the game, but I expect a product of better quality than this, and it's sad that the assistance of a new publisher makes for a worse product than the one from almost a decade ago made by one guy with some Kickstarter money. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is... I think Lisa the Joyful sucks! When does Yik 1.5 come out? I'm ready to play a real man's game.